Let me welcome you to this year's Constitution Day event, sponsored by the Program in American Studies and co-sponsored by the Program in Law and Public Affairs, the James Madison Program, and the Office of the Provost. I'm Dirk Hartog, and I'm the director of the Program in American Studies, and I'm just doing the introductions. Um, I suspect all of you know that we hold this event solely, I mean solely, because we want to and because of our sense of the importance of public commemoration of the Constitution. There is no other reason at all. That is to say we hold it in spite of, in the teeth of, the fact that Congress, under the leadership of Senator Byrd a few years ago, mandated that all educational institutions receiving federal funds are required to hold such an event on pain of losing their federal funding. All that means nothing to us. What we do today is an act of commemoration and reflection. It's worth spending a moment on those words and thinking about what they mean. We may admire and love the Constitution, but the Constitution exists in history, can only be known in history, and it's inescapable to our history, which is complicated at best. What does it mean to commemorate and to reflect? It is not simply to sell or solely to celebrate. It requires of us honesty and critical engagement. Let me suggest two models, both from outside the United States. One is the modern post-wall city of Berlin, filled with markers and monuments and museums that commemorate, that word again, the Holocaust and the now missing Jewish presence. They remind locals and tourists alike of an inescapable presence, which is also an absence. The other is the French habit of putting up patrimony markers everywhere in the countryside. Some mark a late medieval environmental disaster. Some point the tourist to a natural wonder. Some mark where the resistance was organized, another where collaborators worked. Some mark where important literary or cultural figures lived. Others point to labor conflict or famine. It's all understood as part of what makes the French who they are and were, and it reminds the viewer, traveler, that she or he lives is walking through historical time and space. Constitutional markers could do the same for us. Here's where we violated a treaty with the Indians. Here's where James Joyce's Ulysses was allowed to be published. Here's where we authorized torture. Here's where we declared it violative of our fundamental values. Here's where Congress authorized the Fugitive Slave Act or authorized varieties of non-Article III courts. Here's where slavery was framed as constitutionally central. Here's where it wasn't. Here's where a president violated his oath of office. What is wonderful about the talks you are about to hear, or the talk in particular of, of Professor Shepley, is the way it challenges us to think, to reflect, and to commemorate hard about what we think of as the everyday life of the US Constitution. Almost all of us carry with us a picture of a constitution, a good that makes life ordinarily free and protected. And then on the other side, there are moments of crisis when, to use the common phrase, the Constitution has been tested. The Constitution has been tested. What does that mean in ordinary usage? It means that interpreters and political figures in our polity have been tested to see if they will sustain commitments to protect liberty in this constitutional government, to see whether they will sustain their commitment to limited and restrained exercises of power, to see what happens to professed beliefs in self-government and government of the people when tested in a peculiar time of war or threat. And some of the time they have, and other times, more often than not, they have not met those tests. Professor Shepley, as we'll see, suggests, first of all, that the boundary we think we know between ordinary constitutional times and times of testing is an illusion. There is, built into our constitutional frame, a mechanism through emergency powers that have allowed public figures to avoid the test while aggrandizing power to themselves. And in the second place, she challenges our understanding of what is or has been the everyday life of constitutional government. On the one hand, the availability of emergency powers means that governance in a state of emergency is ordinary constitutional government. I have sort of scare quotes around constitutional in that case. Um, on the other hand, what is a constitution but a structure for emergencies? 
Madison may have imagined a machine that would go of itself, as he expressed it in the Federalist Papers, but he quickly learned his own mistake. Our speakers are unqualifiedly to be celebrated, and I'm deeply grateful to them for their willingness to speak to and with us. Kim Lane Chepley, the second director of the Law and Public Affairs program here at Princeton, is also Laurence S. Rockefeller Professor of Sociology and Public Affairs in the Woodrow Wilson School and University Center for Human Values. This year is she's taking a break from us as George W. Crawford Visiting Professor of Law and Robina Foundation Senior Fellow at Yale Law School. She is the author of books about trust and about constitutionalism and many, many articles. When the end of communism came around in the 1990s, she took the unprecedented and amazingly courageous step of moving to Hungary, learning that most difficult of languages, teaching in Hungarian universities to watch constitutional government emerge in that country. She holds a PhD from the University of Chicago. She has taught at Michigan and at Penn. We are lucky to have her here. Deborah Perlstein is Associate Research Scholar in the Woodrow Wilson School and also a visiting faculty fellow at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. After graduating from Harvard Law School and clerking for Justice Stevens on the Supreme Court, she had an active practice in national security law. She served as the founding director of the Law and Security Program at Human Rights Watch, Human Rights First, where she led the organization's efforts in research, litigation, and advocacy surrounding U.S. detention and interrogation operations. Among other projects, Pearlstein led the organization's first monitoring mission to the U.S. naval base at Guantanamo Bay, prepared a series of briefs amicus curiae to the U.S. Supreme Court, and co-authored multiple reports on the human rights impact of U.S. national security policy. Before she began a legal career, she worked as a speechwriter in the Clinton White House. And George Kateb is the William Nelson Cromwell Professor of Politics Emeritus. He served at various times as director of the program in political philosophy, director of the Gauss Seminars, and director of the University Center for Human Values. He's also, to my own thinking, one of the great essayists of the past half century, the author of wonderful pieces on other political and moral thinkers, including Thoreau, Arendt, and others, and other pieces that explore the shifting boundaries on our notions of personal autonomy and privacy. Many of his writings engage, directly or indirectly, with questions of constitutional values. We begin with the speech by Professor Shepley. Comments follow by Professors Perlstein and Kateb. There should be some time for questions from the audience, and then we have a reception in the space outside of the lecture hall. Thank you. Hi, well, it's wonderful to be back, even though I'm actually here permanently. As, as Dirk said, I'm on leave this year, and I love to look out and see so many friendly faces uh, in the audience, so I'm just thrilled to be here. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about today is, again, everyday constitutional life and the way in which I think it's somewhat different than we all imagine. So let me take you back to January 2009. In January 2009, President George W. Bush declared a state of emergency in Washington, D.C. According to his declaration, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, was ordered to, quote, take emergency protective measures to save lives and protect public health and safety, unquote. The declaration put 100 trained FEMA agents at the ready to coordinate the emergency response, and full federal funding was made available to cope with the potential crisis in public order. The emergency, of course, was the presidential inauguration of Barack Obama. And the crowds that were anticipated to flock to Washington, D.C. for the ceremony provided the reason to put the government on high alert. For four days in January, Washington, D.C. existed in a presidentially declared state of emergency. Now, while Washington, D.C. has a special place in the American system, system of federalism, <clears throat> excuse me, it is nonetheless constitutionally unusual when the federal government directly carries out functions usually assigned in the Constitution to state and local government. It is also constitutionally unusual when spending flows from the federal coffers specifically at the direction of the president without benefit of a direct appropriation from Congress. 
Now, of course, you might reply that constitutional intrusions in cases like pre the presidential inauguration emergency are small and sensible. D.C. could not have handled the crowds without assistance from federal personnel and federal money. Surely, the Constitution cannot be so rigid as to prevent such a good idea from being carried out. Moreover, emergencies are declared under a proper law. It's called the Robert T. Stafford Disaster Relief and Emergency Assistance Act, first passed in 1974. This law requires, under most circumstances, that the states ask for assistance before the federal government steps in. That keeps overall control of local law enforcement and service provision in the hands of local governments. The law also provides an explicit delegation of congressional power to the president to handle crises. While the Constitution gave Congress whatever emergency powers were on offer in the 18th century, namely the power to suspend the writ of habeas corpus and the power to call forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and, rebel inv and repel invasions, I quote from the document itself, Congress has delegated the modern cousin of these powers, the power to declare emergencies to the president. Moreover, Congress provides the president with a general pot of money to spend whenever, in his view, an emergency warrants it. So while the determination of how to spend the money in particular ways is a presidential decision, Congress gave him the money and the power for, these, for this purpose. So these observations should counsel us to have constitutional peace of mind. Federalism and the congressional control over both emergencies and the purse are not threatened by these small emergencies declared under the Stafford Act. But peace of mind does not make for the best public lecture. And I would not have suggested this topic for Constitution Day if I thought that the constitutional issues were as simple as I've just made them out to be. Instead, I want to argue that we should not feel at ease with the current US doctrine on emergency powers. For reasons I will explore in this lecture, America has had a lot of small emergencies. So many, in fact, that one might wonder whether the US Constitution whose 220th birthday we celebrate this week is still alive and well. <clears throat> emergency declarations, even these small emergency declarations, have the effect of temporarily changing the balance of constitutional power in order to meet a pressing need. But if emergencies happen often enough and cavalierly enough, the exception becomes the rule. In 2009 so far, we have had 45 presidentially declared federal disasters and six presidentially declared federal emergencies. And actually, in most years, we have more. This is a low year for emergencies. Uh, maybe President Obama has a somewhat different attitude toward emergencies, but usually we have lots more than that. So well, you might object, these dozens of emergency declarations are not real states of emergency. They must be something else. But what else would they be? The Stafford Act provides a congressional grant of power to the president to determine the existence of emergency. And just to give you a sense for how constrained the president may or actually may not be in what counts as an emergency, let me quote from the law itself. An emergency is, quote, any, any occasion or instru instance for which federal assistance is needed to supplement state and local efforts and capabilities to save lives and to protect property and public health and safety or to lessen or avert the threat of catastrophe in any part of the United States, any occasion or instance. Okay. And the president is given the power to determine when there is any occasion or instance, after which powers customarily reserved to the Congress are given to the president, and powers customarily reserved to the states are given to the federal government. The president can ignore some laws in the process. For example, you don't have to do an environmental impact statement. And you may not have to follow federal um, affirmative action rules and so forth. And of course, some rights may be caught in the balance. OK, now, as if this were not all, the ability to cope with emergencies and disasters under the Stafford Act is not the only source of emergency powers available to the president. According to Congressional Research Service uh, expert Harold Relier, who knows everything about this, Presidents declared an additional 42 national states of emergency between 1976 and mid-2007 under a totally different law, the National Emergencies Act of 1976. This is above and beyond all the Stafford Act declarations we've just talked about. So what were those 42 additional emergencies? Well, one was the state of emergency declared by President Bush because of the September 11th attacks. 
Another was a presidential order blocking the property of suspected terrorists right after September 11th. But most of the others were emergencies of which the general public was blissfully unaware. Some blocked trade with specific countries, other, others tightened export controls, some dealt with sanctions against countries involved in weapons proliferation, others blocked dealings with terrorists and drug traffickers. But were these emergencies really? Here again, if an emergency is something that the ordinary person is aware of in daily life, then no. But legally speaking, they clearly were. Now, the National Emergencies Act is the blanket act that covers a myriad of separate grants of congressional power to the president to, to be used when he deems that there is an emergency. So under the Stafford Act, that's one such grant of power. So the, the president would declare an emergency under the National Emergencies Act and invoke the Stafford Act. But there's also a statute granting the president the power to suspend personnel rules for officers in the US military when an emergency occurs. And the most commonly used grant of emergency powers to the president can be found in the International Emergency Economic Powers Act, or no, better known as IEPA, which gives the president the power to regulate economic transactions with foreign powers, as well as to block or seize the property of any foreign national whenever, whenever necessary, and whenever necessary when, quote from the law, in order to deal with any unusual and extraordinary threat, which has its source in whole or substantive part outside the United States, any extraordinary threat to the national security, foreign policy, or economy of the United States, if the president declares a national emergency with respect to such threat. Again, the word any comes up again there. So it's an incredibly broad grant of power. Now, these emergency statutes, all still in force, show that have, emergencies have been brought inside the constitutional order by being normalized in the ordinary legislative process. Emergencies are anticipated, regularized, and regularly suspend constitutional business as usual upon a simple declaration of the president under not much constraint, as we've seen from the language of the statute. The system of emergency action is now part and parcel of what the Constitution has come to mean, that Congress can set up a system of standby presidential authority to act without going back to the Congress for explicit permission in the event the president feels like something extraordinary should be done. Everyone looks the other way because it is so obviously sensible and convenient to have such robust powers in the hands of the national executive at times of crisis. Given that the system of presidential standby authority has become absolutely commonplace in American law, America is a country of many small emergencies. So what do I mean by small emergencies? Well, small emergencies are problems that may be deemed worthy of exceptional solution, but are simultaneously thought to be too minor to warrant a full-fledged reassessment of constitutional structures. They are not seen as fundamentally disruptive of the order all, overall constitutional order of things. They just need minor adjustments when problems overrun our usual constitutional system of governance. But small emergencies are now so routine that they have actually overtaken normal governance. Emergencies have become endemic to the US constitutional order, which has absorbed and rationalized them within the system of public law. In fact, there is hardly ever a time when the US is free from a state of emergency. There almost always is at least one and often multiple ones in force, just so you know. Um, the so-called great presidents, Abraham Lincoln and Franklin Delano Roosevelt, played fast and loose with constitutional rules in the name of civil war and economic emergencies. They aren't alone. Emergency exceptionalism has always had its defenders in American constitutional history. Venerable figures like George Mason, James Madison, Charles Evans Hughes, Oliver Wendell Holmes, and Thomas Jefferson have all been caught saying kind things about exceptional governance. Examples of the use of emergency powers and the full-throated defense of the need to have these powers at the ready are alarmingly common throughout American history. Nonetheless, most people believe that, even when emergency powers are invoked, we somehow still have a normal constitution to which we always revert after the crisis. Constitutionalism and emergency government seem to exist as two different states with a toggle switch between them that one can flip on at the start of a crisis and flip off at the end. This toggle switch theory of emergencies appears most canonically for modern constitutional theory in the work of the German constitutional theorist Carl Schmitt, who conceptualizes the exception his name for the state of emergency, 
as standing outside the law. The exception has to exist outside the law, according to Schmidt, because an emergency is, by definition, incapable of definition in advance. And so, therefore, no law could possibly regulate it. According to Schmidt, quote, the precise details of an emergency cannot be anticipated, nor can one spell out what may take place in such a case, especially when it is truly a matter of an extreme emergency and of how it is to be eliminated. The most guidance the Constitution can provide is to indicate who can act in such a case. And in Schmidt's account, that person is the sovereign. In fact, the mark of sovereignty is precisely the ability to declare emergencies by suspending normal law and invoking sovereign prerogative. But what I want to suggest here is that this toggle switch theory of emergencies, which I think is the way most people think about emergencies, is actually the wrong way to think about emergencies generally. And it's especially the wrong way to think about emer American emergencies as an empirical matter. Looking at American constitutional history, the United States has not in general had a Schmidtian toggle, toggle switch approach to crises in which normal, constitutional and conti normal constitutionalism continues until a switch is flipped to stop it, and then emer the emergency continues until the switch is flipped back to the normal constitution. Instead, the United States has tended to normalize its emergencies by bringing them in from the constitutional cold. Emergencies in the United States have regularized procedure specified in ordinary and not extraordinary law. The effect has been less to set aside the Constitution to cope with crises, the Schmidtian model, than to make normal government far less distinguishable from emergency government. People may have a sense that emergency government is very different from normal government, however, because we have a tendency to look at the extremes rather than the baselines. Most American constitutional commentators examine the Civil War, the Great Depression, the World Wars, the post-September 11th changes, and they generally ignore the smaller crises in between. The focus on extremes puts into the spotlight those extraordinary acts of state that announce themselves as deviations from normal constitutionalism, like the suspension of habeas corpus, the declaration of shooting wars, martial law, military tribunals, the declaration of metaphorical wars, and other trappings of publicly recognizable emergency government. The assumption is that when these things are over, the country returns to what it has been before, which was not itself emergency government. Emergencies look like they are toggled on and then off. This view gains plausibility from the fact that in America and virtually every other stable democratic constitutional state, the government retreats from the extremes when the declared crisis ends. That's what it means to have an ongoing constitutional order, and that is, of course, a cause for celebration. The warrantless searches end, the military tribunals are closed down, POWs are returned. But the analysis of extreme cases misses both that the baselines may have already normalized everyday emergency powers in the first place, and also that the baselines may be moving during a crisis so that a return to the constitutional order after an emergency ends means going back to an order that has moved ever closer to perpetual emergency government. While there are spectacular cases, the US Civil War being the main one, in which the US constitutional order was upended to fight a threat, most emergencies in America are actually, when you look closely at them, generally part of normal government and not particularly exceptional. Small emergencies have become part of what counts as normal. But once small emergencies are normalized, big emergencies are easier to rationalize within this very same constitutional order. Now, how did we get to this point? I'm going to take you through a fast history. And I'm going to start with the First World War, because that was really the first time in which emergency powers were invoked um, uh, well, before the First World War, emergency powers were usually invoked in conjunctions with declarations of martial law. But in response to the challenges of the First World War, this new model of embedding emergencies in ordinary law took off. And by the way, it didn't just take off in America, but you also see this in Britain, in Canada, in a number of other parts of the world where the First World War really changes how emergencies are declared. So as a comparativist, I can't resist that comment. Um, so what happens? Well, President Wilson who has a non-trivial connection with this institution, uh, insisted that Congress give him broad delegations of power to handle the war effort. And though he wanted nearly unlimited powers, President Wilson was given a series of separate, smaller congressional grants of discretionary power embedded in particular statutes. 
The first presidentially declared emergency under the authorization of a statute, our normal emergencies model, took place in February 1917, when President Wilson used a provision of the law that created the National Shipping Board to declare a maritime equivalent of eminent domain over many private ships. Now, some statutes passed by the Congress to give emergency powers to the President during the First World War had sunset clauses, and those ended the grants of power cleanly. But where statutes did not have explicit sunset clauses, Congress attempted to take back its grants of power in the face of strong resistance from none other than President Wilson, who had demanded the powers in the first place. When Congress passed a nearly unanimous bill in the summer of 1920 repealing Wilson's emergency powers, Wilson killed it with a pocket veto. Finally, the act of March 21st, 1921 repealed the remaining emergency powers, but only after Wilson left office. This did not bode well for the congressional control of emergency grants of presidential power. During the economic crisis of the 1930s, there were many congressional delegations of, the, of power to the president to cope with this crisis. But not content to operate only under congressional delegations of power, President Roosevelt declared a state of emergency in 1933, directly invoking his Article II powers under the Constitution. Article II is the is the section of the Constitution that regulates the presidency, and it says nothing explicit about emergency powers. He made extensive use of executive orders to change the contours of the executive branch, though he later sought and largely got retrospective approval from the Congress. This time, however, the courts pushed back, at least against statutes that the President and the Congress jointly crafted in order to cope with the economic emergency in Schechter Poultry versus the United States in 1935 and in the US and US v. Butler in 1936, the Supreme Court blocked Roosevelt's policies, in the first case on separation of powers grounds, and in the second case on the basis of federalism. Roosevelt pushed back harder, threatening the court itself, and the constitutional framework bent rather than broke. The court gave in, not only with respect to the substantive policies at issue, but also with respect to emergency powers. Roosevelt's use of emergency powers changed what the Constitution has meant ever since. In other words, he shifted the constitutional baseline. Now, the economic crisis had not definitely ended before the Second World War began. Once the US entered the war, congressional delegations of power to the president flew fast and furious, and also became broader and vaguer over time. The first War Powers Act, for example, was signed on December 18, 1941, just 10 days after it had first been introduced in the Congress. I think that's even faster than the Patriot Act. Uh, and it gave broad and general powers to President Roosevelt. By executive order, Roosevelt did a lot more, including ordering the internment of residents of Japanese descent on the west coast of the United States. Later in Korematsu versus the United States in 1944, the Supreme Court found Roosevelt's internment order to be constitutional emergency powers had been given another stamp of judicial approval. And again, the baseline moves. Emergency powers were again allowed to persist long after the war was over. Though the second War Powers Act lapsed at the end of 1946, the Emergency Powers Interim Continuation Act did not cease to operate until mid-1953. Okay, that was a statute designed to give the president wartime powers during the Second World War, and by 1953, shall we say, the war had been over for a while. Um, by that time, of course, it was hardly a wartime measure at all. But as it turned out, the United States was already well launched into its next emergency by then, which was why it was so useful to keep this law on the books. At the end of the Second World War, the Soviet Union consolidated its hold over the parts of Europe that its troops had liberated, and it, the Cold War, with, with its associated anti-communist panics, was not far behind. In 1947, the House on American Activities Committee launched its anti-communist witch hunt in Hollywood. By the time McCarthyism ran its course in 1954, hunting communists in high places within the United States, both the US Army and even the president himself were threatened with accusations of disloyalty. In the meantime, however, in 1950, North Korea invaded South Korea, and two days later, President Truman ordered US troops into action there without consulting Congress. In December 1950, Truman, following Roosevelt's lead, declared a state of emergency under his inherent Article II constitutional powers. He was then able to use all the emergency provisions that Congress had written into various statutes over the years, as well as additional powers he claimed were given to him directly by the US Constitution for use in an emergency. But even apart from this Article II declaration, 
Congress was already on the way toward giving the president more emergency powers in the form of the McCarran Internal Security Act of 1950. This law, which was passed over Truman's veto, incidentally, gave the president the power to declare a, quote, internal security emergency. Under the authority of this law, detention centers were set up around the country to house those who might be imprisoned in the event of such an internal security emergency, and the president, given the power to act through the attorney general, was given the power to seize anyone whom he had, quote, a reasonable ground to believe, unquote, was engaged in espionage or sabotage. But while Truman never used these emergency powers delegated to him, although J. Edgar Hoover helpfully gave him a list of all the people who should be rounded up in such a crisis, and the camps already existed, um, nonetheless, President Truman was also willing to use claimed inherent presidential powers with respect to the war effort. When he finally seized some steel mills to keep the war production going, the Supreme Court had other ideas about the extent of his inherent powers. Justice Jackson's famous concurrence in Youngstown Sheet, Sheet Youngstown Sheet and Tube versus Sawyer in 1952 provided constitutional legitimacy for emergency powers that are granted explicitly by statute, while reserving some skepticism for those powers that the president assumes alone. By the way, I should say that by the time um, Truman seized this steel mill that's the subject of the Youngstown case, factories had been seized already more than two dozen times, both by Roosevelt and by Truman. So you could imagine by that time they thought it was fine, so it must have come as a shock when the Supreme Court said no unless you act conjointly with the Congress. Um, the opinion does not reject the use of emergency powers in general, but approves them uh, if they are legally normalized in the form of statutory authorization. So fast forward to Richard Nixon, who broke with the congressional permission model of emergency powers when he claimed inherent Article II powers and he declared two states of emergency, one in 1970 for a postal strike just in case you wondered what happened in 1970, and in 1971, because of a balance of payments problem, um, Nixon also used claims of inherent presidential power to increase the already large-scale surveillance of Americans suspected of, sub of subversion. Thousands of dossiers on individual Americans and groups were amassed, not just under Nixon's time, but Nixon accelerated the process, and Nixon was not above using the structure to spy on his own personal enemies list or to exploit this power to help him win a re-election in 1972. By the time Nixon resigned in disgrace because of the Watergate scandal, he had pushed emergency government resting purely on inherent executive powers to new levels. Now, this was when the Congress actually stood up to this, forming the Church Committee, uh, constituted by the Senate, to investigate governmental surveillance in the United States. And the Church Committee concluded that there had been widespread abuse of power. After these discoveries of a security state gone wild, Congress adopted a number of statutes designed to rein in the use of emergency powers. The Privacy Act of 1974 was intended to protect individuals from secret government data collection. The Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act of 1978 required that warrants be obtained for foreign intelligence gathering operations conducted inside the United States. And the original mandate of the Central Intelligence Agency was restored by banning the CIA from domestic surveillance and investigation. Crucially, however, as part and parcel of the whole Senate reconsideration of emergency powers, the Senate formed the Special Committee on National Emergencies and delegated emergency powers um, at the same time. And this committee spearheaded an investigation into the use and abuse of emergency powers specifically. This committee found that by the mid-1970s, more than 470 statutes delegated what the committee called significant emergency powers to the president. And they also found that all four of those general de uh, declarations of states of emergency presidents had issued under their inherent Article II powers were still in force, all four of them. Uh, and to clean up this vast array of existing emergency powers, Congress passed the National Emergencies Act, which both terminated all outstanding emergencies that were declared pursuant to congressional delegations of power and established new procedures for declaring emergencies with automatic sunset provisions. Congress also passed the Stafford Act and IEPA, the International Emergency Economic Powers Act. Um, so as this quick review shows, the United States was in a more or less constant state of emergency between the economic crises of the early 1930s and the efforts to bring more accountable emergency regulation in the mid-1970s. For more than four decades, the United States drifted from one emergency to 
into the next without sharp breaks in between. Because Roosevelt's economic emergency authority was useful in the Second World War, and because the emergency authorizations of the Second World War were used to launch the Cold War, we can see that emergency powers justified under each preceding emergency were used as the basis for starting the next one. As a result, the permanent state of emergency changed the constitutional baselines and became the new normal. One would imagine that the major reform of emergency law in the 1970s would have resulted then in fewer emergencies. That was, after all, the idea, I think, behind the reforms. But instead, national emergencies have been declared far more often after the reform of the 1970s than before. As things stand now, presidential declarations of emergencies have been regularized, routinized, and taken into normal constitutional practice. Emergencies have become so common that hardly anyone notices them. But the post-1970s system of emergency law received its biggest challenge on September 11, 2001. Many actions taken in what President George W. Bush called the Global War on Terror, or the GWAT, do seem very different from the usual small emergencies that had become routine under the National Emergencies Act, the Stafford Act, and AIPA. But are the post-September 11 emergency policies really all that different in law? For most of what President Bush did after 9-11, the answer is no. The President's proclamation of an emergency right after 9-11 was textbook American emergency law. He invoked the National Emergencies Act. He listed the statutes whose pre-existing emergency powers he was going to use. Even the President's executive order freezing the assets of suspected terrorists under the declaration of a state of emergency followed the rules laid down in the International Economic Emergency Powers Act. These were small emergencies of the sort that have been routinized in American law. But for some of what President Bush did in the name of emergency powers, the answer to whether this is really different is yes. There is a big difference between his use of emergency powers and the sorts of emergency powers that had been normalized before. As we have seen, presidents before George W. Bush have invoked what they claimed were their inherent Article II constitutional powers to protect the country and they have proceeded, generally in tandem with Congress, to do what they felt was necessary. No president had declared an Article II emergency since the 1970s reforms. But President Bush proceeded in the global war on terror as if he had. Unlike in all other Article II emergency declarations in American history, however, President Bush failed to make his declaration public nor for most of his presidency did President Bush go to the Congress to get Congress's approval for the emergency actions he wanted to take. This too had always happened in other major emergencies. Instead, President Bush used secret legal authorization to essentially nullify acts of Congress using an inherent Article II constitutional rationale. How do we know that the president was using novel Article II emergency powers by stealth and not acting with the consent of Congress? We have it in the words of the president's own lawyers. The theme of inherent Article II commander-in-chief powers runs like a thread through many of the official documents that justified the vast and extraordinary conduct of the president of the United States during the global war on terror. What did these documents urge? Well, the Bush administration lawyers in the Office of Legal Counsel of the Justice Department advised the president that he should not feel constrained by particular statutes because an act of Congress that impinges on the president's conduct of a war is unconstitutional. For example, from one memo about the War Crimes Act, I quote, the commander-in-chief power gives the president the plenary authority to determine how to deploy troops in the field. Any congressional uh, effort to restrict presidential authority by subjecting the conduct of the U.S. Armed Forces to a broad construction of the Geneva Conventions would represent a possible infringement on presidential discretion to direct the military. Or alternatively, with respect to the Torture Act, quote, as Commander-in-Chief, the President has the constitutional authority to order interrogations of enemy combatants to gain intelligence information concerning the military plans of the enemy. Any effort to apply the Torture Act in a manner that interferes with the President's discretion of such core war matters as the detention and interrogation of enemy combatants would be unconstitutional. In both these cases, the liberation of the President from the strictures of federal criminal statutes permitted the President to authorize U.S. agents to commit grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions and to engage in torture. <laughs> 
But was such a policy publicly declared in the name of emergency? No. Adding together these stunning assertions of President Bush's conception of Article II emergency powers, one can see that the emergency after September 11th was fundamentally different from the past ones with respect to the sorts of legal arguments that grounded it. The President was not seeking to use his inherent Article II authority in ways that put the Congress on notice that an emergency was going on, nor did the President go to the Congress to seek change in the law by which he was bound. Instead, President Bush's lawyers used their understanding of Article II of the U.S. Constitution to claim that the President was bound by no law at all except the Commander-in-Chief Clause itself. This is where it's important to see that the history of American emergency powers is completely different from the emergency powers theory outlined by Carl Schmitt. In American practice, emergency powers were never outside the law, as Schmitt's conception of emergency powers would have it, but were always alternative forms of legality regulated by Congress and invoked by the President under Congress's watchful eye and under Supreme, the Supreme Court's review. American emergency powers have found a home within the processes of normal governance and within the system of separation of powers, rule of law, and constitutional checks. The emergency powers President Bush invoked were not consistent with this use of American constitutional emergency powers over the last century. He used his Article II emergency powers secretly precisely to avoid the constraints of existing statutes. While President Bush may have been justified in his use of emergency powers by the theory of the exception forwarded by Carl Schmitt, this is not the tradition within which President Bush asserted these claims. Americans have always run their emergencies differently. After the Watergate scandal, Congress bestirred itself to pass a plethora of laws to ensure that the abuses of the Nixon years would never happen again. High on Congress's list at that time was better regulation of emergencies. The new framework of emergency statutes has had the effect of making states of emergency a more routine part of U.S. governance, even while bringing them under legal constraint. After Watergate, we did not get a major constitutional revision. We got statutes designed to make constitutional exceptions normal. Now that the president who has invoked extraordinary stealth emergency powers to secretly nullify statutes has left office, I think it would be wise to analyze what made these unusual emergency powers possible over the last eight years and to find structural ways to curb future abuses of power. I think we need a major constitutional rethink to consider how emergency powers should be regulated in ways that work. But I don't think America is going to have that moment of constitutional reckoning. Instead, the United States, as it always does, will go, back, will go back to what passed for normal before the crisis. We will retrace our history, and we will do what we have done before. But of course, as always, the baselines will shift. First, we will reject the emergency measures, uh, the extreme measures that have been taken in our name. That is what the US usually does when it returns to its sense after a crisis. In his inaugural address, President Barack Obama signaled the return to normal constitutionalism by saying, quote, in his inaugural address, our founding fathers, faced with perils that we can scarcely imagine, drafted a charter to assure the rule of law and the rights of man, a charter expanded by the blood of generations. Those ideals still light the world, and we will not give them up for expediences sake. But the revocation of this latest round of emergency powers does not mean that the Constitution will live without emergency powers. The US has spent much of its history in a state of emergency. As a result, returning to normal does not mean abandoning emergencies, but bringing them out in the open and legalizing them. As with the big national crisis of the 1970s that resulted in the revision of emergency laws, the Obama administration is already talking about regularizing the state of affairs after the post-September 9-11 crisis with new emergency legislation. What is the new legislation that is being discussed nine months into the new administration? In his major national security speech in May 2009, President Obama called for a new law on preventive detention, a law that would enable the extended imprisonment without trial of those who are, quote, still at war, unquote, against the United States, but against whom sufficient information cannot be gathered to put them on trial. In that same speech, President Obama also called for a revised system of military commissions that would stand as specially constituted terrorism courts 
with presumably lesser protection for defendants than exist either in the ordinary courts of the United States or in courts martial. Task forces within the Obama administration are at work on this legislation that would make detention without trial and special terrorism courts the new normal, which is to say, the new face of emergency powers. In short, we are back to emergencies as usual in the American constitutional order. Normal emergencies, small emergencies, are written right into US law, giving the US president increasing powers to handle crises as part of his normal legal job. So where is the Constitution in all of this? The Supreme Court has traditionally approved the use of emergency powers, as long as they are exercised openly by the executive and approved of by the legislative branch. But those of us who care about the Constitution's promise of normal non-emergency government may wonder about the wisdom of such statutes, uh, wisdom of statutes and court decisions that have permitted the ever-increasing powers to be wielded by an ever more powerful president. I think the United States can do better than this. The US Constitution is better understood to require diffusion rather than concentration of governmental power. An emergency government invariably concentrates power in the executive. While it is certainly better for emergency powers to be used out in the open and with a broader political base than secretly and without congressional approval, we should still ask why it is that we cannot live without the constant use of emergency powers. We have a government that has operated for nearly a century with nearly constant emergencies. Small emergencies, routinized by statutes, have become normal. As a result, we have become complacent about emergency government. When confronted with a new situation, whether transnational terrorism after September 11th, or unprecedented crowds in Washington, D.C. for a presidential inauguration, I think we should try first to adapt our normal legal procedures to handle the new situations, rather than creating the shortcuts and workarounds of emergency powers. And I think doing without emergency powers altogether would be the very best way to honor our Constitution. Thank you. Well, thank you um, to Kim for a terrific talk. My apologies in advance for my voice. I hope you can hear me. Despite the hoarseness, I promise it's not swine flu. Um, <laughs> Uh, and thanks to uh, Dirk and Kim and, and Professor Kadep, I'm just humbled beyond words to uh, be included in this panel today. Um, I also find myself in what is personally a um, surprising position of not being as worried as Kim um, about the state of separation of powers, the state of executive power in particular in the United States today. Um, in these brief comments, I want to offer two sets of reactions to Kim's um, terrific paper. The first is to what I take as Kim's descriptive claim, which is, uh, in my view, and, and I hope we'll have time you can correct me if I get this exactly wrong, um, that the U.S. response to, it has been the U.S. response to particular emergencies, or at least perceived or stated emergencies, um, uh, and its decision to, or at least its practice of regular, regularizing the exercise of once exceptional power that has driven the change in the constitutional baseline of separated powers. So to me, one of Kim's primary concerns is, you know, the baseline of separation of powers, where the executive can do this, but not more, the Congress can do this and not more, and so forth, uh, has shifted as a result of um, our response to emergencies. That's what I take as her descriptive claim. So I want to say a few words about that. And, and secondly, I want to briefly address um, what I take to be her primary uh, normative claim, which is that um, emergency government, as she described it, um, invariably concentrates power in the executive and prevents normal government institutions from otherwise um, developing expertise, structures, procedures, uh, mechanisms um, that they would otherwise develop under our normal constitutional separation of powers. Um, and that this is a bad thing, or this is something that should trouble us. Um, with respect to the descriptive claim, to me, the constitutional non-normalcy that Kim is lamenting, where Congress is delegating the executive broad swaths of discretionary power 
is in essence the lament known as the rise of the administrative state in the United States. So if one were to read instead of uh, the Stafford Act, the enabling statutes of the Food and Drug Administration, the Environmental Protection Agency, or a host of other uh, agencies of the alphabet soup, um, one would find similarly, not identical, but similarly broad delegations of power that is otherwise possessed uniquely by Congress to the executive branch, including the delegation of power to executive agencies to, in fact, make law through uh, formal rulemaking and, and, and regulation and a host of other means. Um, it's no question um, I think that some of these agencies and some of the growth and expansion of the administrative state, administrative state were driven by the emergency uh, of the Great Depression, the emergency of World War II, and so forth. Um, but I don't think, or at least I question, whether it's fair to attribute the entire growth and the drive um, in this direction to emergencies per se. Rather, I would suggest that part of the cause um, for the growth of the administrative state and the um, shifting of the baseline of constitutional separation of powers that it entails um, was driven by the regular need to regulate a vast and complicated country, democracy, economy, and so forth that had grown uh, far beyond the bounds of what the framers of the original Constitution could necessarily have contemplated or indeed did contemplate. But delegation has continued to be um, defended by the Supreme Court, uh, delegations of this nature, um, defended by the Supreme Court not only, indeed not particularly on the grounds that, well, in emergencies per se, or wartime, or what have you, um, such discretion is necessary in the part of, of, of the executive, but it's been defended uh, by the court in broad swaths on, on what constitutional scholars tend to call functional uh, arguments, a functional approach to the separation of powers. This contrasts to a formal approach, which is what I take him to be arguing, that the executive should have some powers, was given some powers under the Constitution, uh, and no further should he go. Um, and similar with the other branches. The key justifications that the court has offered, justifications that again transcend um, emergency, uh, thinking about emergency, is that Congress can't possibly regulate the environment, regulate food and drug distribution in the United States, or pick your example, um, in the kind of detail with the level of expertise and attention that good governance would seem to require. So the creation and maintenance of an administrative state serves the functional interest of separating powers, which is enabling government to work well and effectively, um, to enable the use and development of expertise by particular agencies that can act with an insight uh, and a level of understanding that Congress itself uh, can't, possibly, can't possibly have, and we can talk about that as well. Um, and secondly, uh, such delegation serves another functional interest, in particular with respect to the relationships between court and con the, the courts and Congress. Who would otherwise be interpreting what Congress means by um, the enormously broadly worded antitrust laws or the enormously broadly worded um, delegations it wishes to create or, or regulations it wishes to adopt in a host of, um, in a host of fields? Who would be interpreting these laws, if not for the existence of executive agencies, the courts would be interpreting it. So one of the other critical parts of the theory of the court's justification, continued justification of the administrative state, has been transferring, at least minimizing, the court's own power to interpret the law to the at least marginally more accountable than the court's executive branch, executive agency, in interpreting uh, what the delegations of Congress's power actually mean. Why do I think this um, matters? Well, I think two particular reasons here, and I'll get to that more when I get to the normative piece. But as a descriptive matter, it's important, I think, not to give emergencies too much power or a conception of emergencies too much power in changing uh, the constitutional order. Indeed, so it was Jackson in the great steel seizure case um, who rejected the purely formal notion of separation of powers cases and embraced this, I would call, broad vision of pragmatic functionalism, 
one that in language, and, and Jackson's known and, and rightly famous for and highly careful about his language, that was not at all specific to wars or emergencies per se. Rather, Jackson wrote, some clauses of the Constitution could be made almost unworkable as well as immutable by refusal to indulge some latitude of interpretation for changing times. I have heretofore and do now give the enumerated powers the scope and elasticity afforded by what seem to be reasonable practical implications instead of the rigidity dictated by a doctrinaire textualism. Um, Hamilton also, who is often thought of you know, in writing the Federalist Papers as the great advocate of executive power in wartime and in response to emergencies, made clear in the Federalist Papers and elsewhere that he wasn't just talking about um, the special demands that emergencies place on governments, but uh, that in celebrating energy, secrecy, dispatch in the executive branch, he was talking about good government, effective administration more generally. As Hamilton wrote in Federal 70, energy in the executive is a leading character in the definition of good government. It is essential to the protection of the community against foreign attacks. It is not less essential to the steady administration of the laws, to the protection of property against those irregular and high-handed combinations which sometimes interrupt the ordinary course of justice, to the security of liberty against the enterprises and assault of ambition, of faction, and of anarchy. He thus defined energies requiring not only unity, which John Yu, among others, relied on centrally in his emergency justification for broad executive power, but also, as Hamilton writes, duration in office and adequate provision for its support and competent powers. OK, so I would say on the descriptive point, the history is probably um, at least more multi-layered um, than the emergency-driven account sets forth. And I think this is important for a number of reasons. One that I just mentioned, but secondly for understanding um, one of, I think, the challenges to Kim's normative claim. One of the challenges, at least I see, to Kim's normative claim, and again, I'm going to hear exactly why this is exactly wrong, um, or at least I hope to, but, but here goes. Um, the definition of emergencies, um, which Kim sort of offers to an extent, is, um, but, but probably not so much, I think, tells us a lot about what we're really talking about. So when you talk about um, the special demands placed on government in cases of uh, Hurricane Katrina, major natural disasters, or attacks, whether foreign or domestic or terrorist driven or not, these are, in effect, a normal task of government. Call them emergencies, call them situations of special demand. Um, they are something that any government has to, to be effective and sort of protect even the baseline of individual rights, be prepared to respond to. And it's going to respond to them one way or, in one way or another. Either it is going to respond to them with some planning in advance, that is, in some anticipation that emergencies happen, that emergencies are, in fact, normal. Or it is not going to anticipate try to anticipate what the scope of an emergency might be, not try to legislate in advance and so forth. In that sense, and within this framework, I would argue that routinizing emergencies in law through acts like the Stafford Act, um, both in the interest of emergency prevention to the extent it's possible in the event of, for example, terrorist attack, and emergency management is a good thing. Practically speaking, we know from organization theory um, and, and, and some of the great sociologists that Kim has brought into LAPA uh, and the emergency management literature that emergencies exacerbate the risk of effectively arbitrary decision making. Now, arbitrary decision making for individual rights um, lawyers is often code for decision making that ends up overburdening, enormously burdening individual rights per se. Critical information in emergencies may be unavailable or inaccessible. Short-term interests may be seeking to exploit opportunities that run counter to desired long-term or even near-term outcomes. So, organization theorists would say, clear, well-understood rules, formalized training and planning can function to match cultural and individual instincts that necessarily emerge in periods of true crisis with commitments that flow from standard operating procedures and professional norms. Now, this doesn't, I should be clear, make a case in favor or against a law that says, in an emergency so defined, um, torture is good, versus a law that says, in an emergency so defined, torture is bad. 
The good thing is the Constitution offers not only the structural separation of powers, but a host of affirmative rights for helping guide Congress and the people uh, to choose between policy choices um, at that level. But at the structural level, I would say, pre-planning for emergencies, the regularization of emergencies, is um, sociologists and organization theorists of emergencies suggest a good idea. Constitutionally, moreover, it forces pre-planning regularization of emergencies or can force the engagement of multiple branches, as Kim notes. Whereas the executive may have political incentives only to respond to the shortest term crisis. If you're the executive, to cut the rope closest to your throat to respond to the crisis immediately in front of your face and not engage in much planning for an unforeseen um, emergency that may or may not uh, be described or eventuate. Congress, for better and worse, as we've learned from Kim's um, history, has a habit of learning from its past example, uh, from its past mistakes, or at least the country's past mistakes, and legislating in anticipation of the next one. So the Stafford Act, had it been followed in Katrina, for example, which um, is associated with creation of the Federal Emergency Management uh, Agency and a host of other uh, rules and regulations that guide, constrain, and ensure the incorporation of expertise in the executives broadly um, delegated but otherwise constrained exercise of emergency power in the event of a Hurricane Katrina. Um, had the executive followed that guidance, that emergency guidance, we would have been the post-mortems following Hurricane Katrina suggest much better off. So following Hurricane Katrina, one of the most important lessons that independent analysis, including Congress's own rather detailed studies of what went wrong, drew from the government response was the extent to which the disaster was made worse as a result of the lack of experience and knowledge of crisis procedures among key officials. The absence of expert advisors available to key officials, including the president, and the failure to follow existing response plans or to draw from lessons learned from simulations authorized by Congress conducted before the fact. Among the many consequences, basic items like food, water, and medicines, this is in Katrina, were in such short supply that local law enforcement, instead of focusing on security issues that invariably arise, were occupied in part with breaking into businesses and taking what residents needed. What was exceptional about Katrina and the government's response to Katrina is, I think Kim rightly suggests with respect to most uh, to the Bush administration's response to the war on terror, was the failure to follow procedures developed for normal emergencies. Um, this, I think, is something that we should understand. Think about when we think about what emergencies are, but at least ask Kim um, to talk about whether, given the choice between regulating emergencies through um, action in the heat of the battle or uh, action in advance, um, how we as a democracy make a decision between those two, those two polls. Thank you. Uh, Kim Shepley has presented a major paper, an eye-opening analysis of the fate that the U.S. Constitution has endured almost from the start. In the name of responding to emergencies or crises, which are often welcomed as opportunities, the government has continued to expand its powers, has acted in violation of explicit constitutional directives against concentrating power, and gone against the spirit of constitutionalism by encroaching on individual rights. Professor Shepley introduces the concept of small emergencies, which she defines as emergencies deemed worthy of exceptional solutions, but which are thought too minor to warrant a full-fledged reassessment of their impact on constitutional principles. The hit that the U.S. Constitution takes is not noticed or thought minor, and people live their lives as if nothing had happened to their fundamental law. But Shepley thinks that legislatively delegated emergency powers to the executive, when combined with powers that the executive has simply seized or invented, have regularly overtaken normal constitutional governance. 
with every legislative delegation of extraordinary powers to the executive branch and with every act of usurpation of legislative or judicial power by the executive, there results an at least slightly less constitutional government, a constitution that is at least slightly altered for the worse. And sometimes alteration is large. As Shepley puts it in her title, small emergencies undermine big constitutional principles. The erosion of the Constitution usually proceeds by small steps. The trouble is that those specific exceptional powers delegated in small emergencies are sometimes revoked or repealed. The major authorizing legislation often stays on the books and remains fertile for further erosions of the Constitution. In Shepley's words, small increments of emergency powers look as though they have been toggled or switched on and off, but there is never a return to the status quo ante. The constitutional order has been changed, baselines moved, and the political system approaches ever more closely to, in her phrase, perpetual emergency government. Paradoxically, normality is often pushed away from the norm. Indeed, normality, a condition that is free of constitutional erosion, is what turns out to be abnormal. That is or should be a sobering thought. The perfect constitution, then, is a pipe dream. The reality is a constitution that is imperfect in varying degrees, or periodically worse than imperfect. The imperfection can be described in two ways. First, there's a tendency to weaken the separation of powers by inflating executive power, and consequently weakening the Congress and the judiciary, even though with their assistance some of the time. And second, there is the erosion of rights guaranteed by the original Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and the 14th Amendment. Not all rights have suffered erosion. Some have even been enhanced and new ones introduced. It would be a great project to study U.S. history through the lens of changes that have come over the structure of the government and the rights it is entrusted to protect. As far as rights are concerned, it would be in some respects a happy story but in other respects, especially in privacy and the criminal law, a sorry story. I propose to tell, that, uh, to tell this story, the constitutional standards set by the jurisprudence of the Warren Court from the mid-1950s to the mid-1970s and carried on to the present, often by a dissenting minority on the bench, would be the, the guide or the standard for this projected study. There have been not only small, but also great emergencies. That is the other part of Shepley's story. These include the Civil War, World War I, the Great Depression, World War II, and the response to 9-11. Now, is there a connection between the extraordinary powers that a given president claims in a small emergency and the greatly expanded extraordinary powers that another president claims in great emergencies? Shepley's answer is that, and I quote, once small emergencies are normalized, big emergencies are easier to normalize within the constitutional order. That is, the abnormality that is our normality is always increasing, whether by small steps or big ones, and the resulting situation too often comes to feel normal. It's poisoning by small increments. It feels normal to many people, but of course there are always dissenters, like Professor Shepley. Shepley is right to say that the Bush administration's claim to exceptional powers is something new in American history. Just look at what the Bush administration did after 9-11 under an inflated and sophistical interpretation of war powers, the powers of the president as commander-in-chief and the doctrine of unitary executive power, and sometimes with the help of Congress and 
the judiciary. Here are the policies that were devised in the name of responding to a supreme national emergency. Torture. Denial of habeas corpus to people seized in military encounters. Indefinite detention of prisoners. A scheme for military tribunals in which those accused of war crimes and who are being tried under the authority of possible war criminals are supposed to be denied even minimal procedural fairness. Targeted assassinations in large numbers and outsourcing assassination to private contractors. Rendition, secret CIA prisons. Patriot Acts 1 and 2 with their gag rules and secret accusations and secret evidence. Warrantless and comprehensive surveillance of all citizens, which still goes on and whose scope none of us sitting here has the faintest idea what, it, what that scope was. The pumped up doctrine of state secrets and trials, the abuse of the material witness provision for the sake of detaining people indefinitely, the abuse of the provision for the seizure of assets, the enormously expanded trick of presidential signing statements that announced the president's intention not to enforce particular provisions of a law, arbitrary terror lists for air travel, contingency plans so eager they were sinister for militarizing police functions and for setting up a shadow government in case of disruption, and the initiation of a war of aggression against Iraq from hidden motives and defended by entirely false reasons, known by the initiators to be false and destructive of the fabric of a foreign society. This is quite a picture, and I don't even give all of its features. In proportion to the actual needs of security, it is probably the worst power grab in US history. It is a mixture of criminality and selective tyranny. Did we live under Bush in a constitutional society? Do we now? How could we if we are not certain that we do? Just try to imagine what James Madison, the greatest American theorist of constitutionalism, would have thought. How did we get there, Shepley asks, or to ask the question that emerges from a whole paper, from her whole paper, why have we always been there? Is there some approximation to a general explanation for all the deviation from the Constitution through time? I think this is the heart of the matter. The U.S. has always been an expansionist society out of its boundless energy and predatoriness. It has never merely minded its own business. That means that foreign policy, the kind of policy that is most out of reach of citizens and their representatives, and most outside their regular intellectual competence, will give the executive branch its greatest opportunity for unaccountable and untransparent freedom of action. But action that, in the often false or cynical proclamations of emergency, will give a cover to erode rights, as if rights were mainly obnoxious impediments to executive action. U.S. foreign policy is global that is imperialist, and thus the spirit of the Constitution is violated by steady interference with aggression towards foreign societies, while at home rights can be abridged in the name of extraordinary circumstances that the government helps to create. <clears throat> 
think we have about 10 minutes maybe for questions. Or is, Kim, do you want to take uh, you respond to either of the comments? Can I take two minutes? Sure. I just want to say one quick thing because um, because I actually agree with both uh, Deborah and George. In some ways, they're arguing for the same thing from different angles. So one thing Deborah's saying is, you know, we have this 18th century constitution. It had to be modified somehow to have an administrative state, which any 21st century nation has. And the constitution had to had to have been expanded and, re and altered to do that. I completely agree. And George is saying, you know, we've now gotten to the state of having so much executive power that we don't have that constitution at all, with which I completely agree. And so what do we want to say? So, okay, just between us. I didn't say this in my main speech. I actually don't think the U.S. has a constitution. <laughs> it's Constitution Day, okay. But, but we don't have a constitution in the sense in which the United States thinks it does, which is a text that we follow, right? If you read this document and you look at our government, the correspondence between the two is quite small, very small. I think, though, instead that what we have is a British-style constitution, which we have a bunch of legal texts, we have a set of traditions, a set of institutional practices, but where, functionally speaking, an act of Congress can change the meaning of the constitution. That's what the Brits have. I think that's actually what we have. And so Deborah's absolutely right. The constitution has changed its meaning, and the Supreme Court has endorsed that. Is that holding fast to something like this text? I think absolutely not. And I'm actually not an originalist. I don't think we should have an 18th century government. Frankly, I think that would be a really a, a big problem. But the consequence of having a British-style constitution is to have some, uh, many of the problems that George identifies, which is to say, if the constitution is whatever the current Congress and president makes it out to be, and where there is relatively little constraint from some bigger sense of constitutionalism, then I think we fall all the time into these dangers. And the very same authorities that give us the administrative state we need also give us the emergency powers. They're both under the delega so-called delegation doctrine, which we might call the non-delegation doctrine, which we might call the delegation doctrine. And that's how we, we have our constitution. I don't think we actually have a text-bound constitutional system. Questions? Yes. Jerry. I would like to draw a distinction between what you're referring to as the administrative state and something else that I would refer to as a police state. I use that very carefully. Yeah. In an administrative state, there's no question that the, the, the nature of the complex society that we live in, that food and drug administration, things like that have to be administered by a body that is with uh, expertise. But I think what, what Kim was talking about was when you look at most of these emergencies, they give to the executive the power to compel and the power to prosecute certain types of conduct. And so those are police powers as opposed to simply administrative powers. And I think what Professor Kinkup was talking about, in terms of foreign policy, I agree. And I think that the problem there is transparency, because you certainly can't, as a citizen, stand up against an abuse, if in fact the abuse is is secret. And the final comment I would make is certainly that Carl Schmitt in uh, supporting the Article 54 of the German Constitution is what created Hitler and gave justification for that. So I, I think one has to look very carefully at what grants more police powers to the executive as opposed to administrative powers that make life a little bit simpler in terms of regulation. Well, I don't know. Do you, yeah, you start. Uh, so um, I guess I'd like to know a, a little bit more about how we think about the distinction between police powers and administrative powers in this, you know, in in, in this notion. My instinct is to say, certainly, you know, in law school, one learns a distinction between police power and administrative power. The police power gives you the power to arrest and detain, for example, um, uh, whereas administrative power theoretically, you know, do doesn't. Um, the problem is, of course, the executive is engaged, there are, I think, two. 
One is the executive is engaged in the exercise, appropriately engaged in the exercise of police power all the time under the take care clause, right? You know, traditionally thought of Article 2, you know, the president's power to carry out the criminal statutes that Congress passes and exercise what is, in fact, an enormous amount of prosecutorial discretion um, in bringing executive discretion in uh, bringing those laws to bear. So I guess I would say the police power as it exists is is you know, in not any kind of emergency way, the executive has an enormous amount of police power. And secondly, administrative law, you know, has the power, administrative law per se has the power to exact enormous pains and penalties on uh, the, and to withdraw and to grant enormous um, benefits and burdens. Um, and whether it's incarceration per se, I'm not sure okay. makes a constitutional difference. So I guess I, I need to understand more well, of that. My distinction would be that administrative law is is liberally construed, and the constant, in terms of criminal law, it's to be strictly construed. So when you're delegating powers administratively, they're to be liberally applied. When you're delegating police powers that have criminal components, compelling either seizure of property, things like that, they, should, they are more traditionally constitutionally. But in a globalized context, that all gets, and in an international context, that gets much more complicated. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a nice sort of late 19th century division, but it, it gets, it looks very different in, a, in, a, in, in the world today. Yeah. If I can just say one thing, I mean, I think the, the, the functional- I want to get some more questions, though. Yeah, okay. to, yeah, to, if, if you, the functional if, definition between sort of administrative and police works for some of these powers, yeah. but a lot, of, a lot of what happened as a result of emergency powers were new administrative agencies. And so the way I would distinguish it is less by criminal administrative and more by permanent and temporary, right? There are certain things that Congress sets up with the intent that they be permanent. And they have one kind of debate. Should we have this? Should we be like this? And then there are other kinds of things which go under the banner of emergency powers, which are too extreme to be permanent and which are always initiated as temporary and then they become permanent because we get used to them. And so that's the, that's the real difference. And so I'm reminded of this joke, since I know they're, I work in Russia a lot of the time, and there are folks in the room who work on Russia, so let me just say an old Soviet joke. What is the, endure, the enduring legacy of communism? Solutions to temporary problems is the answer, right? <laughs> um, and so there was always the sense that in communism, something was always sort of temporarily going wrong, and that was the permanent state of affairs. Well, that's exactly what I mean is happening here that things start off as too extreme in the moment they're enacted to be enacted permanently, and then we get used to them. And it's that method of changing government that I think is the problem, rather than the specific functions. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Bernie, for that. I'm actually a comparativist, so I very rarely lecture on the United States. This is one of those unusual times when I tried to do that. So yeah, I've been looking at this problem in international um, context, and what you find is that new constitutions almost always have emergency provisions written into them. So most modern constitutions have a section that says, and if there is an emergency, you know, the Congress has to, de or the President can declare it, but the Congress or the legislature has to ratify it within 30 days, and there's this whole long, you can, you can infringe on these rights, but not on those rights, and it's a very... Most systems have these elaborated constitutional structures. Those don't work either. Um, they don't work because they're almost never invoked. So after 9-11, Canada, Germany passed laws that were later struck down by their constitutional, in their process of constitutional review, that were passed as emergency laws without declaring an emergency. Very few of the countries that have those things declare them. And if you have states that declare them, they always, almost always overrun the constitutional provisions, right? So you might get the first step of a declaration according to the constitutional provision, but once you've gotten that far, they just keep going. So I don't think that actually works. In fact, I have another paper in which I try to argue that the only thing that works is redesigning government so that, in fact, executives can't operate alone because there are things they need to do that are under the control of other branches investigating magistrates that are under the control of the judiciary doing criminal investigations, intelligence agencies that have to report to the legislature. Things of that kind, I think, are the only things that fix it. The constitutional provisions don't work so well. <coughs> Maybe one more question. Yeah. yeah. This is a question for Kim, um, and it kind of follows up on what some 
It's about what, what your problem is, um, if any, with um, kind of the way we handle smaller emergencies. Yeah. So granting that there are problems with like lawless responses to big emergencies for the reason that yeah. the yeah. um, I mean, it seems like uh, sort of statu creating statutory frameworks for handling small emergencies seems like a victory for rule of law and legality and fairness and so on. Right. And so I wonder if the objection is either something sort of sociological, is if we just get used to the peasant handling everything, and that enables bigger lawlessness. Or if you think that even within these kind of statutory frameworks, there's a risk of presidential arbitrariness that kind of has the same law problem that you know, official extra constitutional lawlessness Yeah, yeah. It's a good question because, you know, at some level, what do we have but law and how do we regulate this stuff but through law? And Stafford Act and IEPA and all those things are exactly legal frameworks within which emergencies can be declared. So my problem with that is that actually the powers they delegate are really big, right? So, so, the, so the inauguration emergency, the federal government paid for it and FEMA staffed it which is to say something that would normally be an exercise of local government was a federal thing. Okay, now, part of it's that I think that our system of federalism is unworkable. We do all these workarounds because the Constitution sets up a framework that actually can't be sustained in the modern age. And what I would really prefer, if I thought our country were up to it, is a Constitution for a 21st century government, which we don't have. Um, but, you know, the worry is that they're actually quite big things that that are suspended in these small emergency declarations, and of course they make sense. And are they really dangerous? Well, no, sort of, right? But if you actually feel like you're bound by a constitutional structure, these are kind of big things you do to do the workaround, right? So what I would much rather have is a fully constitutional government in which we had a constitution we could follow, right? Where we didn't have to do the workarounds to do the sensible thing to handle, you know, lots of crowds in D.C. for an inauguration. And I would rather call it something other than an emergency, right, that it's crowd control or something. So, so I think what the problem is is that we really literally have, I mean, we're honoring our, our Constitution, um, but all I want to say is that it really wasn't designed for the kind of government we presently have. And the way we patch the difference between the 18th century text and the 21st century state is with emergency powers. And so what you get, I mean, what you learn in civics, right, is the Constitution is at the top of our legal system and all statutes have to be evaluated against the backdrop of the Constitution and so forth, right, and the Supreme Court arbitrates these things. What we have in practice is a Constitution overridden all the time by statute, okay? It's exactly the inverse of the, con of the constitutional textbook thing, and that's why I think we've got a Constitution like Britain, where constitutional norms are overridden by statute. I'm not sure that's the Constitution we think we have or deserve. Thank you all for coming. There's a reception. <laughs> Thank you guys.